Is anybody not ready? Great, because we're at part two now. If you haven't watched part one already, um, go and watch that first, because otherwise you'll be missing out on all of the context. In this video, we are cranking up the Scoville scale and we're really heating things up as we get into the more nitty gritty, the more existential questions, including what is the purpose of higher education? Is it just to prepare people for the workforce? Or is it about learning for learning's sake? Yes, we are indeed going there today, so buckle up, buttercup, hold on to your butts. Firstly, we really have to address ableism in education. Higher education is absolutely based on exclusivity. And I don't mean that in a good way, I'm more in the more exclusionary kind of way, you know, homophobic, racist, sexist, ableist, um, classist, you know, all of those bad ists, um, really, especially historically. But come on now, sweetie, we know that discrimination absolutely still happens. I mean, if any of you watch the documentary, however bad it is, you know, the Barma Rush documentary, um, I'm pretty sure that we all know there is a certain type that is really wanted for higher education, and um, it's not exactly a broad strokes approach. What I'm saying is the entire way of functioning is based on exclusivity and hegemony. Despite having the promise of furthering people's minds, expanding people's social circles and critical thinking skills, how can that be properly achieved when it's not actually accessible to everyone? Traditional schooling is not really accessible to people of differing abilities, and I think that we can all acknowledge that. Not everybody flourishes in a school setting, and uh, that same kind of setting is kind of amplified when it comes to higher education. Neurodivergent people, people with disabilities, people with autoimmune diseases, people with chronic illnesses, basically anybody that has any kind of thing that could make learning a little bit more challenging for them. And there's the other issue with the fact that higher education campuses tend to be fairly spread out in old historic buildings which are not exactly accessible if you have trouble walking anywhere. Even when they have some facilities like lifts, when they break they can be left broken and the student affected can get all the blame for, you know, not trying harder. Ableism at its finest. Academic ableism is a huge issue and there's an entire book on this which has been referenced many times. It points out the issue that people with disabilities in the classroom right from regular school get seen as a burden and hinder the potential performance of superstars and they're dragging everyone down. There have been articles in the New York Times about this, Time Magazine, I mean heck I'm sure that you've overheard it too just casually. It's a nuisance to have to make accommodations for people, for teachers to be distracted by having to focus on helping students and superstars don't get to shine as bright. The other kids don't need this kind of special treatment, these kids are taking away useful resources. <sighs> don't lie, we all know parents and caregivers like that. And this is not to say that disability departments don't exist because so many of you are bringing up the fact that they do. And so from an outsider's perspective, it can seem really accessible because you're like, oh, I see this person go into a quiet room when there's an exam. I see this person get a bit of extra time. So that means the whole place is very accessible. And I've seen a wheelchair ramp or two, so come on. Um, but it's a very different thing to observe it as an outsider as opposed to living it. And that's another Another reason why I really wanted to do the survey because um, living in it, while some of you did have a good experience, pretty accessible. I have learning disabilities and was able to get help and money to help me study. Uh, it's not exactly the best for most of you. <laughs> I was almost not allowed to complete my master's degree due to ableist discrimination. I was literally told that due to my disability I would not be allowed to complete my degree requirements. I was only able to finish my master's after threatening to sue the school. Pretty inaccessible. Peers who struggle with mental and physical health were encouraged to drop out by professors. They had to beg for accommodations and all of that with proof from doctors. The reality of the battle is that it's incredibly hard to actually get any help from the disability services and people get actively discouraged from continuing to study because of their illness or disability. So it's not really as inclusive as you may think as an outsider. One of the things to obviously address is COVID because a number of you are actually attending university or higher education during this time and a lot of it went to online, which is a good thing unless you're one of the people that doesn't actually have access to good Wi-Fi or reliable technology. Technology. And the issue with COVID is it's given some people an invisible disability which is incredibly hard to get diagnosed. And invisible disabilities are often the hardest to prove to actually be able to get the paperwork to be able to show that you need support. But then it's like, what support are you going to get? My doctor literally just told me, I'll oh, just work less. 
great. That's not exactly long-term help. Even if you're able to prove that you have a disability that requires accommodation, whilst the institution itself may say, here's some accommodations, the faculty may hold negative attitudes or outright bully you, expecting you to quit. And we've got people wandering around with invisible disabilities and people are not masking. It makes it a very hostile environment if you're someone that actually suffers from chronic illness. For neurodivergent folk, which I do know I've got heavier leaning of in my audience, especially because of this video up here, um, that your experiences were definitely really good to absolutely terrible. And the other problem here is that in order to be able to get any of these accommodations, you have to be able to get assessed for this. And that costs thousands of dollars and very long wait times. So what are people meant to do? Like there are a number of you who only got diagnosed later on in life and you're like, university was hell for me. Oh, it would have been so much better if I actually knew that I had this then I could actually get some support for it. You know what I mean? It's like, it just makes the barrier to entry that much harder if you're anything other than neurotypical. So without that much needed paperwork, accommodations you need just aren't a thing that's offered to you. Even when accommodations are offered, it's typically literally just go take your exam in a quiet room and here's a little bit of extra time. You know, maybe if you've got dyslexia, they allow for some pre-reading of something. That's not very much. Like I read one of you said that there was a blind student, so other students had to do the work to actually help them out. Bearing in mind that autism exists on a spectrum and ADHD presents differently in everybody. So just having like one blanket rule of here's a quiet room for you, here's a bit of extra time, that's not actually very helpful for people. If people haven't got the tools to help them, then they're going to have an incredibly hard time. You know, what are these colleges really offering if they're not offering careers? It's, it's bullshit. Yeah, it's getting hot now. Let's talk about the job market and usefulness of higher education. Is higher or tertiary education essential to the job that you do now? 26.9% yes, essential. 14.6% yes, couldn't get into the job without at least a qualification, even if it's not relevant to the job. 12.7% sort of, opportunities are slim to none without a qualification. 13.8% not really, but it got my foot in the door by having a qualification. Noting that these no's may be current students because, like I said, I had anticipated only people that had gone through the whole of tertiary education and we're working now to actually participate in the survey, but like I said, that's all good. Basically, only a quarter of respondents are actually using their higher education in their current career. If the purpose of education is to get people into the workforce, that's quite low, okay? If that's the whole purpose, but again, we're gonna be talking about that later. I know from the responses, we've got psychologists, engineers, nurses, doctors, teachers, social workers, um, therapists. Like, there are so many people who have these qualifications that you absolutely do need in order to be able to perform your job. So yes, 100% that degree, doctorate, everything was necessary. A number of you are librarians and you were saying that you had to get your master's degree in order to be able to actually become a librarian and I'm here like, wait, what? Because my image of a librarian is either, you know, like this or because the internet exists, this. And um, uh, turns out that librarians actually do a heck of a lot more than I realized and all of us realized probably unless you're currently a librarian or or something. Um, so yeah, put some respect on Evie, okay? Icon. <laughs> I am a librarian. Notice something about all of these jobs, you have to have the higher education in order to be able to actually do these jobs because you have to have this base knowledge. Like for example, when it comes to engineers, right? Um, even though you do a lot of on the job continual training, like my husband is a team leader and he is constantly training the cadets and everything. But in that scenario, unless these cadets had this base knowledge, then you wouldn't be able to actually teach them how to use this in the real workplace. You know what I mean? Like you have to have the base knowledge in order to be able to then carry on and then learn more on the job in most cases here. It really is the other people that interest me the most with this question because like 14.6% of you said that you couldn't get into a job without at least a qualification, even if it's not relevant to the job. And from what some of you are saying, it's almost like higher education, a degree has actually become like high school 2.0, like you have to have like this extra piece of paper here. And I'm like, what has happened? Because that's not accessible at all. This costs so much money. It causes so much mental anguish and is so inaccessible. Like, this really is not a good thing. There's an article written by Rachel Wells on Forbes, and this looked into whether a degree was still necessary for a high-paying job. Fewer Gen Z are entering into tertiary education. 
As of 2022, only 51% of Gen Z showed interest in pursuing a four-year degree, down from 71% in 2020, while simultaneously interest in community colleges, career-based education, trade schools, technical education, and on-demand learning has been steadily on the rise. Noting that this is USA data, according to LinkedIn's own insights, one in five job posts don't require a degree, increasing by 33% year-on-year. And let's have a look at some actual workplaces in the USA for this. Delta Airlines, Google, IBM, United United Health Group and Penguin Random House are just a few examples of companies that have reduced their degree requirements for their advertised vacancies. Millennials, it's okay to cry a bit now, especially after all that we were told after the GFC, all of the pressure that's been put on us to actually go into higher education because otherwise we're useless and we'll never be able to get a job. There it goes, wow. That was dramatic. Thanks. I looked out the camera so they got it. <laughs> now the trend is moving away from it. What the hell is going on? It's almost like people can't afford to live in this hell, right? But don't go throwing away that college degree just yet because the thing is that employers still see people that have actually gone through tertiary education as being harder workers and smarter, so... Yeah, there's still that battle to come up against. And don't even get me started on the hell that is AI getting involved in HR processes because, oh, this is scary to me. Um, if you're new here, you may not know my hatred of AI <laughs> and how it can be absolutely a terrible thing. Tell me if you want me to actually make that video because I am so keen on it. What the hell is with the normalization of degrees? Well, there is a fantastic article from Vox I really want to talk about because the thing is that higher education actually kind of became a necessity due to things like globalization and deindustrialization of Western countries. Oh wow, can we also bring things back to the late 70s and 80s? Oh, is it Thatcher and Reagan showing up again? Wow. Oh, and also we can't forget Bill Clinton because of NAFTA. <laughs> this comes down to rich and western countries looking to offload work that they deem to be you know quote low skill so they could make the biggest buck themselves sending things to the global south you know countries like china vietnam india bangladesh like these were countries that were absolutely like preyed upon when it comes to where rich western countries were starting to send all of their low skilled labor to and um, the thing is that that's not a really good thing to have actually done if you want more of a holistic deep dive into all of this stuff go check out intellectual media i know that I've shouted out Lex's channel so many times, but honestly, they deserve like a million subscribers. The work that they do is chef's kiss amazing and it's linked below for you. From the 1980s, as tech abilities also grew, tech was replacing workers back then too, and soft skills were starting to be recognized as a wanted skill. So a short form for knowing people had these skills was, you guessed it, a degree. And it just kept on getting worse from there. Of the 11.6 million jobs created between 2010 and 2016, three out of four required at least a bachelor's degree, and just one out of every 100 required a high school diploma or less. Harvard Business School actually did a study in 2017 called Dismissed by degrees, and it found that more than 60% of employers rejected otherwise qualified candidates in terms of skill or experience simply because they did not have a college diploma. So this is a known problem that I'm sure that either you've faced or you've got friends or family members who have faced this, like this active discrimination um, without saying it's discrimination, you know, it's just like, oh, we actually just want to make sure that we're hiring the smarter people, the better skilled people. They've obviously worked harder because they've actually got this degree now, and so they know obviously way more than someone that spent that same amount of time actually on the job working and learning the field stuff of course not always my dude and the thing is right so many of these people are actually in these senior positions themselves deciding who they're hiring or not they don't actually have college degrees or anything like that themselves but then they're deciding that the people that work below them have to have them that feels a bit wrong to me, doesn't it to you? Because they clearly got to where they are by actually on-the-job learning. Whatever happened to on-the-job learning? A Politico piece came out about this too. Prior to the pandemic, the USA spent just 0.03% of its GDP on worker training. That's less than a third of what OECD nations spend on average, or 0.1%. So in the USA, there's an issue where workers aren't skilled enough for the jobs which are needed to be filled. They're not taught the things they need to get out into the workforce. And this is an issue a lot lot of you actually brought up in the survey. Employers have actually been putting less and less money into the training over the course of time and offload that onto the government and then the government's been under-resourcing it and they offloaded it onto the individual and so that means they're left taking on more of the risk. And Goodwill actually found that 84% of their respondents who are unemployed stated they would like help gaining the skills, training and support they need to enter the workforce. 
That's what Goodwill CEO said. So you know this whole BS of nobody wants to work anymore. It's like, no, that's actually wrong. People do want to have meaningful work to do. It's just they need to have the skills to be able to do it. But no one is able to actually invest in that because they can't afford it themselves. The government's abandoned them. Employers have abandoned them. So now we're just in this weird stalemate situation where everyone's just pointing the finger at the individual, calling them lazy. And it's like, that's not true. <laughs> the elitism and classism of only the worthwhile jobs hold degrees has actually really hurt so many countries in the long run. In the UK, even the job market monitor actually showed, although the total number of adults participating in employer-provided training has remained fairly stable over time, the average number of days of workplace training received each year has fallen by 19% per employee in England since 2011. And average employer spending on training has decreased by 27% per trainee since 2011. Since its peak in 2003 to 2004, public funding for adult skills has fallen by 31% in real terms, mostly as a result of reduction in provision of low-level courses. Doing a little hop over the channel to France, they're a country which has actually embraced apprenticeships and they actually had this whole scheme about it, it's what Macron set up. Do not get me wrong, there are a lot of things that France does incredibly wrong, including him, oh, including the fact they're actually going to raise the retirement age despite all of the unions being strongly against this, but someone like Alice Capel can actually go far deeper into this but just focusing on the apprenticeship program that actually came into play in 2018. This reform was a major success with the number of apprenticeship and professionalization contracts growing from 494,000 to 799,000 between 2018 and 2021. That was a growth of 18% per year. It led to approximately 336 additional students in three years, mostly driven by apprenticeship contracts, the focus of the reform. As of Q2 2022, the unemployment rate in the population segment aged 15 to 24 was down to 17.8%, a 6.8% decrease compared with Q2 2017. Macron enacted this very specifically to tackle a particular issue in France, but what we can see is like this investment does actually help. I'm gonna say it again, learning doesn't just happen inside university walls, okay? It's like they're always saying, let's go here, let's go there. Like, we can afford to go here and there. Actually, let's have a look at your debt that you accrued from higher education. 42.9% had no debt. And then when it comes to everybody else, majority of people actually fell into the 20 to 40,000 range, but then it kind of peters off and then it suddenly goes up a lot higher as soon as we get to over $100,000. It's so funny to me that people can get turned down from like renting an apartment or owning an apartment or something, but then people are like, oh, but $100,000 of debt for your education? Yeah, totally, that makes sense, but not for somewhere to live. Make the world make sense, please. If you went into debt or got a student loan, does the job you're in now after going to higher or tertiary education pay well enough to pay off the debt within five years? Consider this repayment along with all of your other living expenses, rent, mortgage, insurance, food, healthcare, transport, etc. 19.6% lol, no. 29.6% NA, 29.4% no debt, 8.1% have it paid off in five years, 2.7%, three quarters paid off in five years, 3.7% half paid off in five years, 1.2% have up to a quarter paid off in five years, 1.5% no, the interest rate is too high to keep up with, and 4.2% no, making minimum payments is hard enough and will take many years to pay off. I wanted to make it five years because I was like, okay, people will probably finish their education about the age of 25 or something, right? And then you want to be able to buy your first home by the age of 30 because arbitrary milestones exist. And obviously the banks really hate debt, so you won't be able to actually get a house unless you're actually like fully paid off. So that was the way that I was thinking of it. Looking at the countries where the debt was the biggest problem, it was no surprise to me what countries these were. You can probably guess them as well. USA, Canada, UK, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, Netherlands, South Africa, and Germany. There were people from the UK saying that like the debt is kind of like fake debt because you're not really expected to pay off because it gets wiped after a certain number of years. But that doesn't really work well for immigrants from what I know. It doesn't really work well if you move countries because there's no jobs in your country that you can actually do with your qualifications. So yeah, um, I, it's not really like a, eh, it's not real because yes, it definitely is real. We're boring suits and we're pantyhose and we're trying to be something that I'm just, I'm just not. You can have many regrets in life, but is higher education one of them? Well, I asked you. 24.2% no, I enjoyed it and used my qualifications, 11% NA, 10.6% yes, it made me miserable, there was too much pressure slash inflexible, 9.4% sort of, I don't use my qualification but skills gained are applicable to my job or hobby, 8.1% sort of, I regret the debt, hmm, understandable seeing those figures. 
8.1% sort of, the experience was good but I don't use my qualification. 4.6% yes, I dropped out so there's nothing to show for my suffering. 1.7% yes, I studied something I was pressured into and didn't enjoy it. And there are a bunch of others honestly actually falling into these same categories. <laughs> In my opinion anyway, you're more likely to have regrets if you actually are one of the people who pay for your higher education and then there's like career issues after that point. There are a number of you who felt cheated because you spent so much money on this education that you invested in and then to actually find when you actually get into the real world, oh, the stuff that I learned is actually kind of useless and I need to learn all of this other stuff as well. And it's like, it's, I understand feeling cheated about that. That makes perfect sense to me. And there is so much information actually available online. You can do online courses, which some of you actually did. And then you learned the things that you wish you could have learned in university basically for free. That's a bad sign. <laughs> Over the years, universities have been kind of becoming a bit more like businesses than learning institutions themselves. This is not a new thing at all, this is something that many people have spoken about. A documentary came out in 2014, a whole decade ago, you're welcome, I made you feel old, called Ivory Tower, where Cooper Union decided to start charging tuition of their students, which the Occupy Cooper Union protest came from. I'm sure you remember Occupy Wall Street? Well, it's the same kind of thing. Education for all was the banner shown, but Cooper Union had taken out a $175 million loan in 2006 to build a fancy new building, and they also invested money in hedge funds, which obviously turned sour with the GFC, something Cooper Union's president, Jamshed Baruka, hope I'm saying that right, to which their defense was, you know, I'm not an investment person, and it's like, are you serious? New institutions were founded as universities. You begin to see a tension developing between the mission to educate young people and the competition for prestige. Colleges and universities have been competing to get students and getting more bloated in order to do so. Since governments keep on taking away education funding, this is a problem which has been growing since the 1980s and getting worse. Students are seen as consumers rather than learners, and places of education are now businesses, not just a place to focus on learning to broaden minds. I did also ask you how useful higher education was in your job, and unsurprisingly, the people like I talked about before, the psychologists, the doctors, the nurses, the teachers, like all of you are saying that is 100% essential because you would not be able to do your job without it. Fully understand that. And then people were saying that they could actually use their skills in their job in different ways, that they learned a whole number of things from their college degrees, which actually made a big difference. Interestingly though, amongst the many of you who suffered and have regret, who said, whilst what you studied didn't directly apply to your job, it got your foot in the door and opened opportunities, as we spoke about earlier. I'm obviously not surprised here. And yes, this particularly favours people who got into the right schools and met the right people but even if you don't go to a super prestigious school, the writing skills and other skills you learnt were essential. And there were people who felt it wasn't helpful at all, especially because of the lack of career advice at a place of education, which feels really wrong to me, honestly. Like, you should have a lot of career advisors available for people who are well versed in what is happening in the world and also what's going to be happening in the future. There were others who said the experience itself made it worthwhile, it exposed you to new people, it helped your confidence, it got you away from home and experience in the world. I would personally argue that actually entering the job force would do this anyway, but I digress. <laughs> Let's move on to the next section. Bella, this school is very expensive and we are paying for you to study and learn, not play around. What's higher education's purpose depending on who it's paid for by? I love being a wooden spoon, especially when it gets people to address their cognitive dissonance or actually think about things that they may have biases about, um, which they may not have realised, um, and that's exactly what I did with the final three questions of the survey. Should higher education guarantee you a job at the end of it? That's the real question, right? And depending on where you are in the world and your financial situation before you actually entered study, that will have a big impact on how you actually see this question. Because if you are paying for it or going into debt for it, then hell yes, you'll be thinking that because that's what you've been taught. But is that what university should be for? So I riddled you this. Do you believe that higher education should be focused on getting people into high paying jobs if self-funded or debt or parent paid? And why or why not? The divide begins. Very easily, I could tell where in the world you're actually from with this response, because um, very heavily in the USA, that was definitely like, uh, uh, yeah, duh, that is absolutely the point of anybody even going into higher education to begin with. A lot of people fell into that category. <laughs> if you're spending money to go, you should get extra pay. You've been working and going into debt, so why go into a poor paying job? A high paying job should basically be a guarantee due to their sacrifice. Oh, okay, buddy, I'm just gonna have to disagree with you right there because are you trying to tell me that because you went into a university and put in your hard yards there, which I'm not down 
scouting is very hard work. Are you trying to tell me that the person that isn't able to actually go to university because it's not accessible for them, for all of the reasons that we've talked about, right? Are you trying to tell me that they haven't sacrificed more by having to actually go into a grueling job, a job that's probably more grueling than what you'll ever actually have to do, and more demeaning because people look down on people if they haven't gone into higher education? Are you trying to tell me that they haven't sacrificed just as much, if not more than you? Because I think they have, okay? This is kind of like a classist attitude and I don't like it. I'm gonna calm down again and we'll get on to more answers. There were people who felt like this should only apply to more specialist jobs like medical, engineering, science, law, etc. as you cannot learn that at work by shadowing co-workers. Higher education should be for those who need the qualifications, you know, like jobs you cannot learn independently. Others felt that professions which require these degrees should be higher paying as they're for the betterment of humanity, a broader stroke in a way, like nurses, teachers, scientists, custodians, for example. Some even pointing out how overinflated certain salaries are. And now we get onto the other key issue, the issue of class divide. No higher education should focus on expanding skills or studying something that interests you, otherwise you're essentially paying to access job opportunities. It's a classist system. You said that very succinctly, my friend. And furthering that thought that no, this is inherently wrong to think like this is everyone should be paid well, as we need people of all skill sets and interests to have a well-functioning society. And relying on people to be treated as lesser than in order for others to be held up because they had a leg up to begin with, that's wrong. Look at roles like nurses, teachers, scientists, social workers, for example. Yes, actually, scientists are not paid very much unless you actually work privately, by the way. Um, a lot of them get paid very poorly, considering all of their qualifications, if we're going on that earlier thing that you were talking about, okay? These are jobs which require degrees, which are actually for the betterment of society, but then they get treated terribly and paid really poorly. That doesn't seem right now, does it? And then there were answers more to the heart of the issue. Higher education is about more than just jobs. It's about broadening people's minds. The benefit of having a higher educated population are numerous. You know, learning for the gosh darn sake of learning. But then we're going up in Scoville's just a little bit more because I asked that same question, but what if the funding came from the government? Should that money then be focused on getting people into high paying jobs, if that's the case? When I was concocting these questions, my answer actually changed for this question because I was like, like, okay, well, the government has a finite amount of money, so I need to put my practical hat on here because, you know, we don't get very much in taxes. Here in Aotearoa, we have a huge child poverty issue. We have issues with teachers not being paid enough, nurses not being paid enough, so many people not being paid enough. Like, there's all of the infrastructure that needs to be taken care of. That There's a lot of things that need to get taken care of out of taxes, right? Well, in that case, shouldn't government funding actually go towards, you know, public good jobs, you know, like, for teachers, nurses, social workers, like scientists, like, all of these sort of like care workers, like all of these sort of roles absolutely do require higher training. But I was also like, all of those jobs need to also get paid more. Um, that was my line of thinking and that was how I thought of it. So that's my answer for this because I fully understand why a government would want to get like ROI on this and make sure that, okay, this is the public's money, so it should go for public good. That was how I was thinking of this. But you know what? We all have different lived experiences and you all have very different takes on this. Some people were completely against the government paying for education at all. Like the amount of mistrust in the government is a lot in some people. And there was one example from Russia, which is particularly grueling. It's on the screen now, so you can actually read it. Um, but I would argue that is a scary Russian government issue as opposed to an issue with the concept as a whole. It's not actually communism over there. I think that we know that, yeah, yeah. Others were thinking if the government's funding it, then it should be for getting people ready for useful jobs where you actually require higher education. Now, interestingly, there were a number of folk who were actually just refusing to change their answer from their question previously, just saying the exact same thing. But there was a little bit more understanding for the need for ROI. Because, you know, like I said before, we don't just have limitless amounts of money. I mean, we're not taxing the churches, are we? And we're also not taxing rich people properly or closing up those tax loopholes or tax havens, like here and also Ireland is a big one. <laughs> well. Oh, tax havens are not a good thing. <laughs> and then there were other answers saying, while well, the government should be educating people to get them into jobs, the focus of education should be helping to upskill people so they can go to work and have pathways in order to follow that. And then we had the pink crowd, um, because that is how I organize all of this. I color code everything because that is how I handle my Excel spreadsheets in life. That the government should be helping people into jobs that we need and paying these properly and actually valuing the work that people do in order to make society function. And here I was thinking I was being all good and right in my take, but lo!
Apparently not. A huge number of you actually slay me down completely, saying that the government should pay for all higher education, as the purpose of it should not be just on jobs, it's for the general betterment of society. Because STEM gets such a heavy focus, yet look who's dominated that field, white men. Why are we devaluing work like the arts, childcare, social work? We shouldn't be devaluing the fact that sharing knowledge and learning to work with others and understand others, even if you don't agree with them, is a really important thing. And to quote one of you, absolutely not. Education should be a right, but based on the right to learn, not to earn. Ooh. Who taught you that tagline? That's a good one. It's getting hotter. <laughs> Everybody should go to higher or tertiary education. Thoughts? Yeah, this one tore a lot of people up, huh? Critical thinking is something which so many of you brought up as your defense for why everybody should go to higher or tertiary education. And I would just argue that um, you don't have to go to higher or tertiary education to be able to get there. I don't know uh, what you think, but um, I would say that I learned that in high school. Um, and you can also learn that just from actually existing in the world. You don't have to have higher education to do that. And you know what? Conspiracy theorists exist even if they have a degree. So it's not really a good kind of measure of critical thinking, I wouldn't say, because that's existed all across time. It's just that now we have easier ways for that to be able to connect and for like misinformation to like run rampant online, okay? But yeah, I'd just caution that because then you're kind of saying that anyone that hasn't gone to higher or tertiary education kind of critical thinking skills because you can, okay? Um, it's, it's leaning into that classism once again that we don't really like on this channel, okay? A huge part of my personal problem with this take is the fact that not everybody actually flourishes well in a regular standard classroom setting from school all the way up to higher education right it is not a welcoming environment if you're anything other than quote normal um which i hate by the way when we literally ascribe so much of a person's worth that when we meet them what do you do defines how seriously we should take them to the point that the amount that they earn is directly tied to this it's just classism in action and it hurts me so much to think about in all honesty what a lot of you were also saying that everyone should be able to go to higher or tertiary education, which I absolutely agree with. And I fully agree, especially when people were saying that it needs to be far more accessible than it actually is. Not just in terms of finances, not just in terms of location, but like to cater to different learning styles and realize that people actually have lives outside of university, that people have jobs, that people have children, that people have like people that they have to care for in their lives. There were a lot of people that were saying that yes, people absolutely should because of the experience to actually spend time with other people and all of that stuff. I'm not opposed to the statement, we should aim for a universally highly educated population. I don't think tertiary education is necessarily the way to get there though. Tertiary education has imperial roots we really haven't reckoned with, but also the unduly high weight we place on formal education devalues all sorts of indigenous education systems, as well as devaluing trade schools and apprenticeships. I disagree with it fundamentally. Even though higher education itself is definitely for me in that I want the knowledge and experience, but the current uni system is not helpful for me as someone supporting myself and working full time. I think more value should be placed on vocational trades and other career paths, and young people should be taught to engage critically with their relationship to work. The mixed messaging of do what interests you, but what interests you should be respectable and academic is not healthy or helpful. I know too many people wasting their money on a degree for the sake of doing one, even though they aren't enjoying it and probably won't benefit from it career-wise. I do think that everybody who wants to go to higher education should be able to go to higher education and we're going to talk about that more in the next section. What can we actually do? What can we strive for? What changes could be made to make things better? You know me, I love hope on this channel. You know that because I don't want us to just be in this pit of despair in this capitalistic hellscape that we're living in, okay? So Bryony, what can we actually do then to make things better? Um, I know, I'm just a YouTuber, okay, um, but I can summarize a lot of the points that you brought up throughout this whole video and also redirect you to someone that has actually written an incredible book about a whole number of issues that really do desperately need to be solved. I've brought this up before, but it's called What We Owe Each Other by Manu Shafiq. She's worked in government and for the World Bank after all, and like she's very well versed in economics and everything, and this is something that where she has pulled from 
a multitude of different scientific papers from and social papers and actually worked on this for ages and so let's have a look at some of their recommendations because they have a whole chapter on education. Here are some of the highlights for how to make education better. Education needs to shift its focus into understanding the information that is actually available to people because it's kind of like remember when your math teacher used to tell you oh you won't be able to have your calculator with you at all times and it's like haha we actually have supercomputers with us at all times instead. That's one of the issues is we need to be able to actually sift through the amount of information that's available to us, digest it and actually extrapolate useful things from it. That's one of the key things along with all of the amazing adaptability skills that people need to know in order to actually cope in an ever-changing workforce and an ever-changing planet that is just getting hotter and hotter by the second and really scaring me but ah! let's not get too much into my climate anxiety today. One thing she brought up which I really liked was we need to shift our thinking of careers from climbing a ladder to be more like climbing a tree. You can move sideways, diagonally, it takes all sorts of different skills and movement is no longer linear, especially in our fast changing tech world. We need to shift the focus on education to not just be pedagogy, which is teaching children, to adult learning, which is andragogy. I don't care if I'm mispronouncing that at this point. I've been filming for over four hours, okay? <laughs> in a world where changes are happening on a really fast scale, the focus on just children and young adults needs to change. Plus, in my opinion, and from a lot of you, the pressure to enter higher education when you're so young means that you can go and study something that you don't even use. You go into debt for that. There should be better career guidance and counselling, something that you kept on bringing up in your responses, and Manoush raises this too. And it shouldn't just stop when people are 18 or 20 or something. It should should keep on going for a longer period of time in life. I know that um, people can be like, oh, what's a 40 year old doing going to a career advisor? Your career can change like up to seven times across your lifetime. And when you think about it, when you're 40, people pass away in their 80s. You've still got like 40 years left of life left. Do you really want to be in a job that sucks? <laughs> no. <laughs> the same job for the rest of your life? I didn't know that. What's the difference? And you'll be happy to know that bees as a species haven't had one day off in 27 million years. Woo. So you'll just work us to death? We'll sure try. <laughs> <laughs> On the solution side of things, one possible solution is to give every 18 year old an entitlement for lifelong learning. Say £30,000 in the UK or $50,000 in the USA. This could be in a grant or a loan, at university, vocational training at certified institutions. Rather than graduate with a burden of debt, everyone gets an entitlement to empower themselves to invest in their own employability. According to Manoush, most people will have to undertake further education in their lives for their career. And by having this amount available at any point in life for them would mean that they can do this when suits them, as opposed to just this pressure on an 18 year old as it is now. But she does stipulate that this needs to be closely tied to businesses, which goes against the point that many of you are actually raising about the importance of higher education, of just learning for learning's sake, to just be able to have the opportunity to change your mind, to expand your mind on things. Now, it won't surprise you that Manoush is kind of focused on keeping things the same way. She's a bit of a pro-capitalist and that's probably why I don't agree with everything, but it's like I said, you can still learn stuff anyway. Currently, employers focus resources on high-skilled individuals, which isn't right, it isn't equitable, it isn't fair. Only two in every five adults has access to education in advanced economies, and those with less skills are three times less likely to participate, either due to lack of confidence in themselves or because companies just give up on them. This is especially problematic for people with low skilled jobs or jobs that are automatable. Hospitality, data entry, sales reps, secretaries, manufacturing. Identifying and supporting these workers acquiring new skills should happen before they become unemployed. Whether the company pays for this or government funds it is left to be seen. Personally, I've raised this example for when it comes to things like coal mining towns, you know, because everybody relies on the coal mine to actually work, but we need to get away from fossil fuels like now. And there needs to be government intervention to actually help transition people away from this. There needs to be government funding to actually educate people to be able to get different jobs and actually provide those opportunities for people as opposed to just making people flounder and feel threatened by the fact that we actually need to like I don't know save the planet the ecosystem the environment people and everything <laughs> company training is incredibly effective and should be done more but there's an issue with smaller businesses not actually having the budget to be able to do this and this is where the problem lies who pays for the education and training 
government, the individual, taxes on all businesses. This is definitely a problem still to be solved. She suggested that adult learners share in the cost of education, but again, I would say that this disproportionately hurts people who don't earn as much money as others or who are lower skilled than others because they don't really get the same sort of opportunities, you know? And these are the people that really need upskilling the most, so it's, it doesn't really seem like a fair system to me. Employers are unlikely to pay for training if they think that their employees could leave, so it's kind of like you could lock people into a five-year contract or something or they have to pay the company back. You know, that is something that absolutely exists already today. She notes that there's so many complexities in the systems that it's very challenging to try and create rules for this. Like there could be tax credits given to some companies, this happens in Germany and the Nordics. Singapore compensates employers 90% of the cost of retraining workers over the age of 40 and they also repay some of the salary of the employees who are undergoing reskilling. Research consistently finds employer-based training is the most effective but employers only have the incentive for training up to a point. One other thing that she talks about, which I do really strongly agree with, is it's critical that the flexibility of study, especially for adult learners, you know, being part-time, online, a hybrid model, you know, different things which suit the needs of the workers, parents, different disabilities. There is such a huge level of inflexibility when it comes to higher education, as so many of you have actually dealt with and been through and struggled with, that this is something that needs to be addressed, not just for the kids, kids that are going through it now, but also for adult learners as well. And I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, everyone can learn, change it, grow at whatever age they are in life. I fully 100% believe that. I've seen it. I know that people can. So I really don't like this whole pressure on like you need to know exactly what career you're going into at the age of 18 and go for it. Now when it comes to this book there's nothing really revolutionary about it. It's assessing the system as it is and trying to find ways to basically keep capitalism going. <laughs> um, so you can obviously tell that I'm going to have problems with this but that doesn't mean that some of the solutions that they were actually thinking through couldn't actually work. Um, but it does require quite a bit of change. It does require potentially higher taxes, it requires workplaces to actually work better with government, and it requires governments to actually have some backbone and actually say no employers need to support their workers. <laughs> hmm. uh, will we see that? I don't know. <laughs> so obviously I haven't found the solutions to all of these problems, but we can absolutely recognize that there are a lot of issues where we can change our own mindsets, where you can have these conversations with other people, and where our voting can actually have a really big difference and also um join a union i keep on telling you join a union unions are fantastic there are shifts in our own mindsets that we can absolutely do ourselves and this is something which i encourage basically on every single video of mine and if you are dealing with parents that are really stuck on this whole like you have to get a degree sort of thing hopefully what i've actually provided over these um past two videos has actually been helpful for you one of the biggest tips is actually to have a gap year to kind of like figure out the world a little bit more figure out yourself a little bit more um because uh, yeah, um, trying to take on that level of debt and that level of responsibility of like, this is the exact career path I'm going to go down. Absolutely. At the age of 18, I don't. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's good. I know that there are some of you who actually are adult learners and you went in to study later on in life um, after things had settled down for you or after you had kids or something. And I think that that's fantastic. And I really want more normalization of adult learners because we need that. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, it's just the funding of it is the more challenging thing, you know. That's that's what I really need to get our heads around. And that's exactly why I keep on telling people, be informed voters. Voting is a good thing. And we also really need employers to shift their outdated mindsets of thinking that a four-year bachelor degree is needed for every single job because no, it is not. We need employers to actually take more on when it comes to the training of their employees. And I'm not just on about like, you know, orange orientation stuff and what about like actually ongoing upskilling and learning of their employees because that is incredibly important. It's one of the best ways for people to actually learn things um, but unless that's something that companies even budget for, that's not really going to happen, is it? I think that you can tell I don't think that higher education works for absolutely everybody, but I do think it's really important that there is more in the way of apprenticeship opportunities, vocational studies opportunities. I think it's really key that we actually try and push the government to push for this more across whatever country you're actually living in. Another thing is we need to actually start treating people as people instead of just seeing them based on their worth in terms of how much, you know, book smarts education they've gotten uh, from 
going to a university, which is completely inaccessible for a lot of people. I want to thank you all once again for participating in that survey. I know it was very long. Um, 520 of you, once again, it was amazing to actually read through everything. It was so much reading to do. It was very hard. If you do ever want to participate in my surveys, as I've said before, they are always posted in my community tab. The best thing to do is subscribe and hit the bell notification so then you're notified of every time I upload something or post something in my community tab. Um, I will see you all again soon. My next video is going to be about breakups, um, which I've been wanting to make since last year, but I feel like it could be a bit spicier now. So it's going to be a bit more fun and there's going to be more misogynists absolutely hating me, which <laughs> I don't care. Um, bring it on because every time that someone comments something because they hate me, I'm like, you're actually just boosting me and you're actually just meaning that you're going to get more videos like mine. So you're just going to be suffering more. <laughs> Uh, critical thinking, huh? Is that what you were talking about? I wonder if those people have got a college education. <laughs> anyway, lovelies, if you made it all the way to the end, the emoji to leave is, I think, the thinking emoji and also possibly the, the thought cloud emoji. I think that those are both fitting. I will see you next time. Thanks once again for watching. Bye. A secret final quote from one of you because I love this and also it's from here in Aotearoa so I've got a bit of a bias here, perhaps. I have mixed feelings because I think if I hadn't have gone, I never would have been exposed to different views and probably would have stayed brainwashed from my very conservative upbringing. I have been struggling with the idea of education as a colonizing tool. I think if education was recognized more broadly, trades too, ancestral wisdom and practices, then that would be better. I think everyone should keep learning throughout their life, but of course it doesn't have to be through the formalized, colonized exclusive experience of higher education. There is just so much more to life than being graded for essays and exploding brain cells with stress. Very, very well said. I love this so much. Thank you all again so much for watching. I will officially go now. Bye. <laughs>